chemistry can be just as much a hobby as photography, stamp collecting, handicrafts, and other pastimes. Chemistry is a science which has grown out of the study of chemical changes. When a chemical change takes place in a substance, the latter becomes one or more new substances with new properties. A common and familiar change is the rusting of iron. When a piece of uncoated iron is exposed to air and moisture, the iron changes into a red substance called rust, which is not at all like the original metal. The souring of milk, the decay of fruit, and the charring of wood are other common and familiar chemical changes. It is not necessary to be a chemist in order to find chemi chemistry interesting. Chemistry has much to offer the boy or girl with an inquiring mind. For those who understand its teachings, its rewards with knowledge of a constant practical value. No other science has contributed as much to our understanding of the material things which surround us. The profession of chemist is open to both men and women. As a hobby for boys and girls, it is filled with fun and adventure. Almost everything which comes within the range of our five senses has, has some direct association with chemistry. All the essentials and luxuries of living are the results of chemical processes. Our homes are made more comfortable and beautiful. Travel is faster and safer. Illnesses are cured and labor is lightened by the use of a great variety of materials that were unknown when our parents were young. Chemists discovered these materials and chemical processes produced them. Look around you. Any material thing you can see or think of, whether it is furniture, an automobile, building materials, soap, toothpaste, medicine, food, or anything else, is a result of chemical processes. The clothing you are wearing was bleached, dyed, and finished by chemical processes. If you wear rayon, its beautiful silky fibers do not come from a plant, from an animal, or silkworm. They are a man-made chemical product manufactured from wood chips. Of course, many of these things are shaped and formed by mechanical processes, but the materials from which they are made were produced, colored, and given strength and protective finishes by chemical factories. From food, air, and water, our bodies manufacture the substances which form our bones and tissues, supply energy, and provide chemical weapons against disease. Even our thoughts have a chemical basis. A chemical experiment is a chemist's way of ask asking nature a scientific question and securing a scientific answer. Whenever he wants to know what a substance consists of, how it can be made or improved for a particular purpose, or what its uses are, a chemist can do three things. He can look for the information in chemistry books, inquire of other chemists, or he can experiment. One experiment may not furnish the knowledge he is seeking. Several, even hundreds or thousands, may be necessary. He may spend years in solving his problem. The point is, all of our vast knowledge of chemistry is the result of experimenting. It is a vast knowledge because more than 500,000 different substances have been studied by chemists and the list is still growing. In general, we all remember best those facts which have been gained through experience. Dozens of chemical processes occur every day in our homes. Cooking is a chemical process. The iodine, alcohol, bicarbonate of soda, vinegar, salt, and baking powder in the medicine chest and pantry are no less chemicals because they are used in the household and are the substances in the glass stoppered bottles in a chemist's laboratory. You can use foods, cleaning compounds, medicines, the common things found in a pantry and medicine chest. All of these things can be used in small experiments. But even in small experiments, there are some things which we need to remember. Pharmacists, chemists, and careful experimenters always look at the label on a bottle or package twice before they use the contents. This is to make certain that it is the correct substance. Practice this when you do experiments. Do not mix any chemicals unless you have a book which tells how and tells what quantities to use or you have instructions from a competent adult. Chemicals are not intended to be put in your mouth, rub in your eyes, spill on rugs or furniture, or be left where your little brother or sister can reach them. If you get chemicals on your hands, wash them thoroughly. The four most important words in a chemist's language are atom, molecule, compound, and element. It is necessary for you to know the meaning of these four words because you will know a great deal more of chemistry. You will be able to see in your mind some of the things that occur when which your eyes cannot discern. 
Even when aided by powerful microscopes, our eyes cannot see everything that exists. We have no sense of perception for many things. For example, we cannot see electric currents, magnetism, or radio waves. Yet, in spite of the fact that these three things are invisible, we have a fairly good idea of what they actually are. We gain that idea because science makes use of imagination. Scientists, by using their imagination to guess at the truth, learn the nature of these unseen things. The undoubtedly accurate description of electric currents, magnets, and radio waves which scientists have presented enables us to picture them in our minds. This knowledge led to the development of such comforts as radio, television, and the wide distribution of electric power for lamps and motors. We have no sense of perception for many things that occur in chemical processes. Our eyes cannot see all that happens during chemical action. The original materials seem to disappear and produce a new substance often entirely different from any of the ingredients from which it was made. Things do not happen without cause, so chemists put their imagination to work on this problem. They reasoned that in a chemical action there must be some mechanical shifting of materials in order to build new substances. When a house is built, there is a shifting of materials. We can see the bricks or stones and lumber going into place. Could it be that the shifting of materials in a chemical action is invisible because the materials are made of such small units that they are unseen? Are the bricks or stones and lumber of a chemical action too small to be seen individually? For example, is a piece of lead, though it seems smooth and even to our eyes and touch, actually made up of grains of lead too small to be seen by the human eye? For about 100 years, the idea that all substances might be composed of units or particles too small to be seen by the human eyes was repeatedly tested. After it had survived all such tests, chemists began to accept it less as a guess and more as a fact. Today, practically all chemists accept it as a fact. No use of the imagination ever brought more practical benefit to mankind. The idea that substances are made of tiny particles made it possible to make diagrams of the manner in which the particles were joined together. As a result, the science of chemistry began to grow by leaps and bounds. Countless new manufacturing processes came into existence with the growth of chemical science. On our Earth and in the atmosphere surrounding it are about 90 substances that are called the elements. Oxygen, hydrogen, neon, helium, iron, copper, tin, sodium, lead, and carbon are names of ten elements which you will recognize. Others such as diprosium, gadolium, lutetium, and holomium you have probably never heard of unless you have previously seen a list of the elements. Some of the elements are quite plentiful and not difficult to find. Others are extremely scarce, so scarce in fact that only a few chemists have ever seen even a very small quantity of these rare substances. The elements are often called the building blocks of the universe. That is a good description because they join together and form countless different substances. Everything in our universe is made of them. Chalk is a combination of the elements called calcium, carbon, and oxygen. Iron rust is a combination of the elements iron and oxygen. Water is hydrogen and oxygen. In the human body are found more than a dozen of the elements in many different combinations. If you could take all the things in the universe apart and sort the different materials of which they are made, you would have 92 different piles. Each pile would contain a different element. Man has always been curious about the inside of things. Chemists have the most curiosity in that direction, and it, has, it was their prying that uh, revealed the elements. Further curiosity disclosed the tiny particles of the elements, which are called atoms, and the small particles composed of combinations of atoms, which are called molecules. The words tiny particle do not well describe the smallness of atoms and molecules. They are not only so small as to be invisible, but so exceedingly small that their size cannot be imagined. By mathematical calculation, it can be shown that the diameter of an atom must be less than a ten millionth of an inch. If 30,000 atoms were piled one on top of the other, the height of the pile would only be equal to the thickness of, the, of a piece of paper. If a drop of water could be magnified to the size of the earth, each molecule in a drop would appear to be the size of a walnut. Atoms do not exist alone and by themselves for long. They prefer to become part of a larger group called a molecule. 
They may join with another atom of their own kind or join with atoms of other elements. Some molecules contain only two atoms. Others may contain a great many. We find in the atmosphere molecules of oxygen which contain two atoms of oxygen. These are common. We do not find any single oxygen atoms drifting around, but after a thunderstorm, there is a small proportion of oxygen molecules consisting of three atoms. They are called ozone. Any substance whose molecules contain more than one kind of atom is called a compound. But let us now pause and sum up with a few simple definitions of, first, the elements. A chemical element is a substance that cannot be separated into simpler substances. Atom. In a chemist's language, an atom is a small particle of an element which is not permanently altered by chemical action. If we could take a small quantity of any element and divide it into many small parts and keep on subdividing each particle many more times, we would wind up with a tiny particle so small that it could not be further subdivided without losing its character. This smallest particle still retaining its identity would be an atom of the element. The English word atom is derived from the Greek word atomos, which means indivisible. Molecules. A molecule is the smallest particle of a substance which has the properties of that substance. Compound. A compound is a substance that can be separated by chemical means into two or more simpler substances. Most of the common things which we can see, touch, or smell are compounds. Water is a compound. It can be separated into molecules of oxygen and hydrogen. A glass of water is a glass full of compound molecules, each one consisting of two atoms of the element hydrogen and one of the element oxygen. The chemist uses the symbol H2O for water. Water is our most important compound. The ancient Greeks believed that the world was made of four elements, one of which was water, the others were air, earth, and fire. We know that the Greeks were wrong, that there are now known many more than four elements, actually more than a hundred, and that water, air, earth, and fire are not among them. We also know that water is composed of two elements, the two elements, oxygen and hydrogen. It is not difficult to make water out of oxygen and hydrogen. We do it frequently. Whenever a substance containing hydrogen is burned, water is formed. At first it is in the form of vapor. When the vapor cools, it turns into the liquid which we know as water. The flame of a gas stove and a burning candle are producers of water. So are automobile engines. When gasoline or oil burns in the cylinders of an automobile engine, Hydrogen in the fuel combines with oxygen in the air and forms water. Each gallon of gasoline burned in an automobile engine produces about seven pints of water. On a cold day when a car is standing with its engine running at idling speed, the water can be seen as it trickles from the exhaust pipe. It is estimated that automobiles in the United States manufacture about 18 billion gallons of water weekly. It issues from the millions of exhaust pipes in the form of vapor which spreads through the atmosphere and eventually comes back to the Earth's surface in the form of rain. Every glass of water that you drink probably contains a very small amount of water that was manufactured in an automobile engine. It is not difficult to reverse the water making process and separate water into the two elements of which it is composed. An electric current will change the familiar liquid into the gases, oxygen, and hydrogen. The water used in our homes comes from reservoirs, wells, cisterns, or springs. Reservoirs are generally supplied from rivers, wells, lakes, or springs. But whatever may be the apparent source, the real source of our drinking water is rain and melting snow. Water is usually so commonplace that we think little about it until it becomes scarce. When wells and springs go dry or the supply is temporarily shut off for repairs to pipes or pumps, we suddenly become unusually thirsty. No life can exist without water, and we can live longer without food than without water. Water is undoubtedly the most important compound on Earth. When we are in good health, our bodies contain a large amount of water. 
In the tissues of an adult, there are about 10 gallons. From 3 to 10 quarts of this water must be replaced every day. We do not usually drink that amount of water because we get part of our supply from our food. When foods reach the dining table, they are almost three quarters water. The water may be hidden, but it is there. Three quarters of a ripe potato is water and about four fifths of an apple or a fish. A watermelon is 96 to 98 percent water. In their work, chemists use more water than any other compound. Most chemical plants are located where water is plentiful and inexpensive. One reason is that few chemical changes can take place without water. Water is also useful in a chemical plant for washing away waste substances. Water is important because it forms solutions with many substances. There's nothing startling about our first experiment. However, it has an important purpose. It assists in explaining the solutions which chemists make from water and other liquids. It also explains some of the chemical terms used in describing many of our later experiments. Chemists use solutions and so do you. You have made solutions many times, probably without realizing it. Whenever you have stirred sugar in a glass of iced tea or lemonade, you have made a solution. Whenever you drink water, your body will use it to make solutions. Here are the things that we will use. We will use some salt, sand, we'll need a bowl, a glass tumbler, a teaspoon, and some water. Now we will use clean sand, because this is required for this experiment. The sand which masons use in mixing concrete is satisfactory. You can wash sand if you put a handful in a pan, let water from a faucet run over it until the water which flows away is clear. Put a teaspoonful of clear or clean sand in a tumbler of clear water. Stir it for a moment, and when you stop stirring, the sand will settle to the bottom of the tumbler. You can see it there. It has not been altered in any way. Sand does not dissolve in water, so, so far you have not made a solution. Now we will add a teaspoonful of salt, table salt. This is the common salt which is used to improve the flavor of food. We will add this salt to the sand and water and stir again. The salt will disappear. It has dissolved. This time we have made a solution. Although the salt is invisible, it is still present. If you were to put a drop of the solution on your tongue, you would be able to taste the unseen salt. Since salt dissolves in water, a chemist would say that it is soluble in water. Because sand does not dissolve in water, we would say that sand is insoluble in water. Our experiment is finished, and as promised, it has not been spectacular. But it has brought water to our attention in its role as a solvent. Liquids which dissolve substances are called solvents. Water is the most plentiful and the most useful solvent. It does not dissolve everything as the attempt to dissolve sand demonstrated, but it does dissolve more substances than any other fluid known. Best of all, this most useful solvent does not have to be manufactured. Nature provides it. There are many solvents besides water. None of them will dissolve nearly so many things as water will, but some will dissolve substances not affected by water. Alcohols, and there are several kinds of alcohols, naphtha and carbon tetrachloride are good solvents for certain substances. Shellac will not dissolve in water, but will dissolve in alcohol. Naphtha will dissolve gum rubber and greases and oils. These do not dissolve in water. You probably know that water will not wash grease spots off clothing, but that naphtha will. Another good solvent for grease and oil is carbon tetrachloride. Can you name any of the solvents which find use in a household? The most common are water, turpentine, alcohol, carbon tetrachloride, banana oil, ether, dry cleaning fluids, and varnish remover. All except the first are used to dissolve substances which will not dissolve in water. Turpentine is used as a thinner for oil paints and varnishes because it will dissolve the oils and rosins or resins which these substances contain. If water is mixed with oil paint, varnish, or shellac, it will change them into a gummy mess. Alcohol is used to dissolve shellac. Shellac, by the way, is manufactured by insects. Did you know that? 
Some insects are useful chemical factories. For example, bees make honey, silkworms make silk fibers, and an insect which lives on the twigs of several species of East Indian trees makes shellac. Carbon, tetrachloride, is a household solvent, frequently used for remo removing grease spots from clothing. The cleaning fluid, called carbona, contains carbon tetrachloride. You will also find it in small fire extinguishers of the pyrene type. And here is a bit of useful information. The vapor from carbon tetrachloride is poisonous. It is not dangerous to use this liquid for a few minutes to remove a few small grease spots if you do so in a well-ventilated room. If you ever have to use a carbon tetrachloride extinguisher to put out a fire, do it quickly and get away from the fumes as soon as possible. Carbon tetrachloride quickly smothers a small fire, but the heat of the fire may change some of the vapor into phosgene gas. Phosgene was used in World War I in gas attacks and in shells and bombs. It is very poisonous, much more so than the vapor from carbon tetrachloride. Banana oil is a colorless liquid which chemists call amyl acetate, and it is used to remove nail polish. It has an odor like bananas. Nail polish and many quick drying lacquers for automobiles, furniture, and metals are made by dissolving nitrated cellulose in banana oil. Ether will dissolve the sticky substance left on the skin by surgical adhesive tape. It will also remove paint spots from clothing. The vapors of ether are explosive. Ether should not be used near a flame or in a room which is not well ventilated. Naphtha and benzene are sometimes used in the household for dry cleaning, but they are both so inflammable that they are highly dangerous. Their use in a home should be forbidden. A flame is not necessary to ignite the vapors of these dangerous fluids. A tiny electric spark produced by friction can do it. Your sleeve rubbing against your jacket could thus cause an explosion. There are other dry cleaning fluids which do not vaporize as easily as naphtha and benzene, and they can be used without great danger. The fluid called Renzinti is one of these. Another solvent sometimes used in the household is varnish remover. There are many varieties of varnish removers, but all of them should be used with care. Most of these liquids produce explosive vapors and may con contain benzol, the vapors of which are poisonous. Some people are more susceptible to benzol than others, and deaths have occurred as a result of using varnish remover containing this benzol. If you wish to remove paint or varnish with one of these preparations, open the windows in the room where you are working. Do not expose yourself to the fumes for more than a minute or so. If you are working on a piece of furniture which is movable, the best place to apply the varnish remover is out of doors. There are solvents which will dissolve substances which water does not dissolve. The need for solvents other than water is demonstrated by this experiment. The things we will need here are sealing wax, some butter, glass tumbler, small bottle with a stopper, alcohol, some dry cleaning fluid, and water. What we will do is to crush a piece of sealing wax until we have it small enough to fill a teaspoon. We'll put it into a tumbler of cold water and stir the mixture. Sealing wax is colored shellac, which has been melted by heating and cast into sticks. Cold water will not soften or dissolve sealing wax. The experiment that we will do will prove this. Boiling water will soften sealing wax slightly. What will happen if you use alcohol instead of water in this experiment? Well, we could try this and find out. We'll drain off all the water off from the sealing wax, and if we strain it through a piece of cloth, none of the wax will be lost. Place the recovered wax in a small glass mayonnaise jar or jelly glass. Do not use a good tumbler unless you have plenty of alcohol to clean it with or are willing to throw it away after this experiment. Pour enough alcohol into the tumbler to cover the wax to a depth of about one inch. You can use the alcohol used in automobile radiators or the denatured alcohol for sale at hardware and paint stores. 
Rubbing alcohol will be unsatisfactory because it is diluted with water. Cover the tumbler so that the alcohol will not evaporate. If we let the sealing wax soak in, an, in it for an, undisturbed for an hour, and at the end of that time we will find that the alcohol will have become discolored. We will also find that most of the sealing wax has softened and dissolved. When the sealing wax has dissolved, if we add enough water to half fill a tumbler, the alcohol will be so diluted that the shellac will leave the solution and form a thick gum. The shellac used for finishing woodwork is always dissolved in alcohol. Alcohol has many uses as a solvent in, in, in industry and in the arts and medicine. Alcoholic solutions of drugs are called tinctures. A familiar tincture is tincture of iodine. It is a solution of iodine in alcohol. We will use it in experiments later. The perfume industry makes use of the alcohol to dissolve the essential oils which, apply, which supply perfumes with their fragrance. No substance, substitute for this purpose is known. Certain flavoring extracts, vanilla for example, require alcohol as solvent. A complete list of the substances which dissolve in alcohol only would be a long one. If you have ever tried to wash a greasy dish in cold water, you are aware that the water does not dissolve such common greasy substances as bacon fat, gravy, butter, mayonnaise, oil margarine, lard, Crisco, and salad oil. Hot soapy water will clean greasy objects, but not by dissolving the grease. It cleans by another process which we will experiment with later. If you have never done much dishwashing and are unaware that the common greases do not dissolve in water, try this experiment. Put a small piece of butter in an empty bottle and add cold water. No amount of shaking will cause the butter to dissolve or to disappear by dissolving in the water. If you cause the or change the experiment slightly and instead of water use one of the common, common cleaning fluids such as carbona, renizit, or carbon tetrachloride, you will get a different result. Shake a small piece of butter up in a bottle containing one of these liquids and it will dis disappear. It will dissolve. These experiments show that while water is our most important solvent, it does not dissolve some substances which are readily dissolved by other solvents. You may be interested in testing some common substances such as sugar, flour, baking powder, powdered chalk, powdered sulfur, lime, and so forth to see if they will dissolve in water. Solutions vary in strength. A solution is not a compound, it is a mixture. In any sort of mixture, the proportions vary. In a compound, they do not. In a quart of salt water, there may be dissolved a few grams of salt, or it may contain several uh, teaspoonfuls of salt. A few grains of salt dissolved in a quart of water make a weak solution. Chemists call a weak solution a dilute solution. Several teaspoonfuls of salt dissolved in a quart of water make a strong solution use the word concentrate, concentrated to describe a strong solution. A solution that contains all of, the, of a substance it is possible for the solvent to dissolve is a saturated solution. In this experiment we will make three of these three varieties of solution. The things we'll need is water, salt, teaspoon, and a glass tumbler. First we will fill a tumbler half full of water. Then we will add to it one-fourth teaspoonful of table salt and stir until dissolved. Since a glass full of water will dissolve much more than a fourth of a teaspoon of salt, this may be considered a dilute solution. We will add more salt and stir again. We will keep adding salt slowly and stirring. The solution is becoming concentrated. Keep adding salt until no more will dissolve. At this point, the solution is as strong as it is possible to make it and it is therefore saturated. Which is the best solvent, hot water or cold water? Hot solvents can usually but not always dissolve more of a substance than an equal amount of the same solvent can when cold. Substances usually dissolve more quickly in hot solvents than in cold solvents. You may have noticed that sugar dis dissolves more quickly in a cup of hot tea than it does in a glass of iced tea. Here we will take two cups, two spoons, two lumps of cane sugar, boiling water, and cold water. In this experiment, it's a race between two lumps of sugar. First, 
Fill one of the cups almost full of boiling water. Next, we will put the same amount of cold water in the other cup. Choose two lumps of sugar of about the same size and drop one in, in e one in each cup of the sa at the same time. We will stir the contents of both cups at the same time. The sugar lump in the hot water will dissolve faster than the one in the cold water. Hot water will dissolve more cane sugar than will an equal amount of cold water. This is not true of table salt. Practically the same amount of salt dissolves in cold water as in hot. You can prove this if you try to experiment with it. Heating the water will not increase the amount of salt it can dissolve, as we have said. An interesting action may take place when some liquids evaporate, and this is called crystallization, and is much like a magician's trick in which something seems to appear from nowhere. You probably already know that when liquids evaporate, they change into invisible vapors. Did you know also that a solid which has been dissolved in a liquid and so becomes invisible will return to a solid when the liquid evaporates? The solid may form in the patterns known as crystals. Not all substances form crystals. A crystal has a symmetrical geometric shape and often is transparent. Some varieties of crystals are beautiful. Many chemicals which we see in powder form were originally crystals. They are ground into powder at the factory because in that form they dissolve more easily and are more convenient to package and handle. The shape of a crystal often serves to identify the substance of which it is composed. For example, salt crystals are always cubes or parts of cubes and alum crystals are always eight-sided. The best grade of table salt is produced by evaporating salt solution, which we call brine, pumped from salt wells. When you sprinkle table salt on your food, you are not using a powder, you are sprinkling tiny crystals of sodium chloride. Scientists have learned a great deal about how atoms and molecules arrange themselves in groups by studying X-ray pictures of crystals. X-rays have revealed that a crystal of salt is built up of chlorine and sodium atoms arranged in an interesting pattern. The length and width and height of one of these tiny elementary cubes of salt crystal is only about one hundred millionth of an inch. We can make uh, salt crystals. It is not difficult to demonstrate that any substance which has been dissolved in a liquid will return to a solid state if the liquid is evaporated. We can do this by using a glass tumbler, a small pan, some table salt, water, a teaspoon, and a stove. Fill the tumbler half full of clean water and add a heaping teaspoonful of table salt. Stir the mixture until the salt has disappeared and you have a clear solution of salt and water. Pour the solution in a small saucepan and place it on a stove where it will heat very slowly. The heat will cause the water to evaporate. When the water has disappeared, you will find the bottom of the pan covered with salt crystals. Examine them with a magnifying glass and you will be able to see that they are small white cubes. You can prove that by they are salt, of course, by tasting them. Large or larger crystals will be formed if you allow the salt solution to evaporate slowly in the heat of the sunlight instead of rapidly in a stove. Pour enough salt solution into a pie or cake pan to form a layer of solution one-eighth inch deep. Place the pan where bright sunshine will fall upon it. When all the water has evaporated, examine the white cubes of salt on the bottom of the pan with a magnifying glass. Compare these crystals with those formed by the ev evaporating the salt solution over a fire. And of course we should find that they're much larger. A crystallized food. A pound of granulated sugar is a pound of crystals of sucrose. Sucrose is the chemical name of ordinary cane sugar. It is found in sugar cane, beets, maple sap, and certain fruits and vegetables. The cane or beets are crushed to extract their juice, which is treated with lime and with carbon dioxide to remove impurities. The juice is then treated so that it, its water evaporates, and what is termed raw sugar is left behind in the pan. The raw sugar goes through several chemical processes before it becomes the refined syrup which forms the snow white crystals we find in a sugar bowl. An enormous quantity of sugar is used as food. The average annual consumption in the United States is nearly 100 pounds per person. When the word sugar is used in a home or grocery store, it usually means cane sugar. In a laboratory, sugar may refer to any number of sugars, the best known of which are sucrose, glucose, fructose, lactose, and maltose. 
These all have a sweet taste and will dissolve in water. Glucose, also known as dextrose or grape sugar, is made from starch. When you buy a candy bar, you will find its ingredients listed on the wrapper, and glucose is almost always one of them. It is used extensively in making candies, jams, jellies, table syrups, and alcohol. When we eat either starch or cane sugar, our, our internal chemical factory changes it into glucose. Fructose is the sugar found in honey and fruits. Lactose is commonly known as milk sugar because it is found in small quantities in cow's milk. It is used in baby foods. Maltose is the sugar which is formed when grains such as barley are sprouted. Most of it is used to produce alcohol. Much of the candy maker's skill lies in his ability to control the crystallization of sugar. Nougats, caramels, taffy, creams, hard candies, and other forms of candy have different consistency, not only because their ingredients vary, but because the candy maker controls the formation of their sugar crystals. He heats and cools his batches of candy so carefully that the sugar either does not crystallize at all or forms, or forms crystals of the size he desires. Large sugar crystals called rock candy were a treat to the boys and girls of 50 years ago. You can make rock candy in your kitchen laboratory. The things that you need are cane sugar, water, glass tumbler, spoon, small pan, string, pencil, measuring cup. Make a saturated solution of granulated sugar in water. To do this, use a measuring cup, the sort used in a kitchen for measuring when cooking. Pour one cup of cold water into a small saucepan and heat it to the boiling point. Place a cover on the pan so that none of the water will be lost by evaporation. When the water boils, turn the heat off and add one and three quarter cupfuls of granulated cane sugar to the water. Stir until all the sugar dissolves, then let the solution cool. When cool, pour the sugar solution into a glass tumbler and hang a piece of cotton thread or string in it. Tie the upper end to a pencil laid across the top of the tumbler. Place the tumbler where it will remain cool and undisturbed for several days. In a few hours, small crystals will form on the string. Later, they will also appear on the sides of the tumbler. The crystals will grow large if undisturbed for a few days. Some may become one half inch long. They are hard as rock and are called rock candy. You can eat them if you have strong teeth. Crystals and crystallization are useful. Crystals have a great many uses. A diamond is a crystal of carbon. The use of diamonds as jewels is due to their beauty and scarcity, but is not important. Diamonds are the hardest substance known and are used in industry to cut and polish other hard substances. Many manufactured articles could not be produced without tools with diamond cutting edges. Another hard crystal not quite as hard as diamond is quartz. Quartz crystals are widely used in radio and telephone communication. In radio, they keep transmitters and receivers in tune so that their frequency remains constant. It would be impossible to have a large number of broadcasting stations in operation at the same time without the aid of crystals. In a telephone, crystals of quartz are used in sending many conversations over the same channel at one time. A crystal guides each conversation and keeps it from becoming tangled with the others. Quartz crystals are used in electric circuits because they produce a, an electric current when squeezed or disturbed slightly, and also because an electric current will cause a quartz crystal to move slightly. A few other crystals, among them alum, topaz, floor spar, and tourmaline, possess this useful property. They are known as piezoelectric crystals. Piezo means pressure. Most phonograph pickups consist of piezoelectric crystal connected to a needle. The needle follows the groove in the record and its movements vary the pressure on the crystal. The crystal converts the movements of the needle into electric currents which are amplified and produce speech, music, and other sounds in the loudspeaker of the phonograph. Some of the microphones used in radio <coughs> telephone and for broadcasting utilize piezoelectric crystals. Sound waves striking the diaphragm in the microphone exert a varying 
pressure on the piezo crystal. The tiny electric current which the crystal generates is then amplified and sent out through space. Crystallization is useful to chemists. Crystallization is often employed by chemists to separate one substance from another and to purify compounds. It is a simple process. An impure compound which will crystallize is dissolved in distilled water. The water is then evaporated until crystals form. The water is not completely evaporated. That which remains is called the mother liquor. Most of the impurity, impurities are in it. The crystals are comparatively free of impurities, but not always pure enough to satisfy a chemist. So the mother liquor is drained off and the crystals are again dissolved in pure water. This solution also is evaporated until crystallization takes place. Then the mother liquor is drained off. The second batch of crystals is purer than the first, but still may not be pure enough for some purposes. Sometimes the crystallization process is repeated dozens of times with the same batch of material in order to obtain an absolutely pure compound. Professor and Madame Curie worked patiently for eight months to separate half a teaspoonful of radium from over eight tons of impurities. A mixture of sand and salt will enable you to demonstrate how crystallization can be useful in refining or recovering chemicals. It would be a Herculean task to separate grains of salt from grains of sand e and even a small amount of such a mixture if you had to do it with a pair of tweezers and a magnifying glass. But it requires only a short time by the crystallization method. Put a teaspoonful of dry sand and a teaspoonful of table salt in a tumbler and stir or shake them until well mixed. Add enough clean water to half fill the glass. Stir the mixture for a minute or two to dissolve the salt. Let the sand settle to the bottom of the glass. When the solution has cleared, pour it off the sand into a small pan. Do this carefully so that no sand gets into the pan. Warm the salt solution on the stove until all the water evaporates. Most of the salt which was mixed with the sand will be found crystallized on the bottom of the pan. If you wash the sand left in the tumbler, it will be freed from any traces of salt which remain. Water is a part of some crystal structures. If a thin layer of dry salt is placed in the bottom of a pan and heated, it will produce faint crackling sounds. The sounds are caused by bursting of the salt crystals. They are burst apart by steam pressure. Salt crystals contain a small amount of water which is invisible. It is enclosed in the crystals. When the crystals are heated sufficiently, the water changes to steam and its pressures blow them apart. Unless <coughs> the pan was heated very gently toward the last when the salt was almost dry, you may have heard the crackling sounds of bursting crystals at that time. The water in salt crystals is mechanically enclosed. It is not what a chemist calls water of crystallization. Some crystals contain a small amount of water, which is a necessary part of their structure. If deprived of, e of it by he heating or in some cases by merely being exposed to the air, they crumble into powder or become a formless mass. This water is water of crystallization or water of hydration. A substance which contains water of crystallization is called a hydrate. When a substance which contains water of crystallization loses this water, it becomes an anhydrous compound. In the next experiment, we will change a hydrate into an anhydrous compound, and you will know that the, what these terms mean. If you read or study chemistry books, you will probably run across the words hydrate and ha anhydrous many times. Common household chemicals whose crystals contain water of crystallization and are therefore hydrates are sugar, borax, and washing soda. Merely looking at a crystal will not reveal its water of crystallization, but its presence in crystals of washing soda is easily revealed by an experiment. The things we need will be washing soda and a small pan. When you examine the contents of a package of washing soda, you will notice that this useful household compound consists of semi-transparent crystals which are covered with white powder. Brush or wipe the powder off a few crystals of washing soda. Put them in a small pan or can cover and heat them on the stove. They will sizzle and in a moment dissolve in their own water of crystallization. 
Continue heating and all the water of crystallization will be changed into steam. A white substance which can be easily crumbled into a powder will be all that remains in the pan or on the can cover. The washing soda crystals lost their crystalline form when deprived of their water. The white powder is anhydrous washing soda. Anhydrous means without water. At ordinary temperatures, the crystals lose their water of crystallization slowly by evaporation. Heating them, as in our experiment, hastens the loss. Washing soda, by the way, is a chemical compound called sodium carbonate by chemists. Its molecules contain atoms of sodium, carbon, and oxygen. We will use washing soda in other experiments. Plaster of Paris. Heating a compound to drive out its water of crystallization has practical uses. The chalky white powder called plaster of Paris is made in this matter, manner by heating gypsum, a soft white crystalline mineral. Gypsum is also used as a fertilizer and as a raw material in the manufacture of cement. Gypsum is calcium sulfate, calcium, sulfur, and oxygen, and its crystals contain water of crystallization. Most sulfates dissolve easily and therefore are not found in the earth in the form of minerals. If they ever existed there in ages past, they have long since been washed away. Gypsum is only slightly soluble and is one of the few sulfates which are found as minerals. When gypsum is heated under careful control so that three-fourths of its water of crystallization is driven off, plaster of Paris is left behind. Plaster of Paris is said to have acquired its name because it was first made from gypsum rock found under the city of Paris, France. When mixed with water, plaster of Paris recombines with the same quantity of water the gypsum lost when heated. If this regains its water of crystallization and sets or hardens in a few minutes into a hard crystalline mass of artificial gypsum. When gypsum is heated so that all of the water of crystallization is driven off, the dead, burnt gypsum left behind is called Keen's cement. When mixed with water, it will not set by itself, but will set if a small quantity of alum is added. With the addition of alum, it sets very hard and is used in making interior walls and artificial marble. During the process of setting, plaster of Paris expands slightly and is therefore useful in making molds and casts. It is used in industry, medicine, dentistry, and the arts. Injured limbs are sometimes made immovable in order to heal by wrapping with plaster smeared bandages. When you are old enough to need false teeth, your dentist will push some soft plaster of Paris against your gums and hold it there until it sets. Thus he secures an impression of your gums to use in making your new denture. This is a fancy name for false teeth. Plaster of Paris mixed with calcium hydrate, that is lime which has been mixed with water, forms a white finishing coat on walls and ceilings which we call plaster. Plaster of Paris sets when its water of crystallization returns. Reproductions of sculptures are often made by pouring plaster of Paris, which has been mixed with water, into a hardened plaster of Paris mold. A finished plaster casting can be given an ivory surface by dipping it in melted paraffin. It is not difficult to make plaster molds of small objects. You can make a mold of a large coin, metal, button, or other flat object in a few minutes. Suppose we make a mold of a coin or metal about the size of a 50 cent piece or a silver dollar. The things needed, of course, are plaster of Paris, water, Vaseline, coin or metal, small pan, teaspoon, and a strainer. First, we rub a thin layer of Vaseline over the inside surface of a small pan about four inches in diameter. Dime stores sell a small pan of that size, which is just right for this purpose. Also, rub a thin layer of Vaseline over the coin or other object, which is to be the pattern for the mold. The Vaseline will prevent the plaster from sticking to the coin and the pan. Lay this coin in the center of the pan. The plaster of Paris should be mixed in a clean empty can, number two vegetable can, which can be thrown away afterward. Pour one fourth cup full of clean water in the can and add 14 or 15 rounded teaspoonfuls of plaster of Paris by shaking or scraping it through a piece of fly screen or a gravy strainer. The plaster is sifted into the water to prevent lumps from forming in the mixture. Stir the plaster in water enough to make certain that all the powder is wet, but do not stir it too long or it will begin to set. The mixture should be about as thick as ordinary cream. It may need a small amount of additional plaster to give it the right 
consistency. You must do the mixing quickly and efficiently or the wet plaster will begin to set before you are able to use it. Pour the mixed plaster over the coin lying in the pan. Tap the edge of the pan lightly for a minute to jar loose any small air bubbles which may be trapped in the plaster and cause them to rise. Then set the let the plaster set for 10 minutes. It will become warm. It is giving out some of the heat which was absorbed when the gypsum was heated to drive out, it, to drive out its water of crystallization. When the plaster has set firmly and while it is still warm, turn the pan over and jar it so as to separate the plaster from the pan. Use the point of a penknife blade or, or a large needle to pry the coin out of the plaster. Let the mold dry and harden for a day or so. Water is often used to bring about chemical action. Strangers often sit in the same seat on a bus or train and do not speak to each other. But if a mutual friend introduces them, there is immediate activity. A great deal of conversation takes place. Water is often the mutual acquaintance which introduces chemicals to each other. Many substances which have no effect upon one another when mixed while dry will begin chemical activity when dissolved in water. Therefore, water is one of the tools which a chemist employs to bring about chemical action. The baking powder found in the kitchen cupboard can be used to demonstrate the important part water plays in chemical action. Baking powder is a mixture of dry chemical compounds which is inactive while dry. We take baking powder, glass tumbler, and water. What we do is to drop a pinch of dry baking powder in a glass half filled with water. As soon as the dry powder dissolves, chemical action starts. Small bubbles of the gas called carbon dioxide are produced. This is the same gas that forms the bubbles in soda water and ginger ale. When used in making cake, the dry baking powder dissolves in the water in the dough and bubbles of carbon dioxide gas are formed. The bubbles cannot escape as easily though through the thick dough as they can from water and so they blow it up into a sponge-like mass. A baker would say that they cause the dough to rise. If you examine a slice of cake, you can see the pores produ produced by the bubbles. Cake made without baking powder would be hard and tough and difficult to digest. You can separate water into oxygen and hydrogen in your home laboratory. Chemical action can produce an electric current. An Italian scientist, Alessandro Volta, discovered this fact in 1800 and made the first battery. The electric current which lights the small lamp in your flashlight is produced by chemical action. Flashlight batteries are modern forms of Volta's invention. Chemical action generates the electric current which batteries produce. This process may be reversed in a current of electricity used to bring about chemical action. Therefore, chemists employ an electric current to pry liquids and solutions apart. Many products important to our wel welfare, comfort, health, and happiness are the result. Aluminum, abrasives for grinding, fertilizers, the molybdenum used to give strength to steel, and the life-saving chlorine used to purify drinking water are a few of the many products manufactured by the Union of Electricity and Chemistry. The first compound to be pried apart by an electric current was water. In 1800, two English scientists, Carl Isle and Nicholson, sent an electric current from one of Volta's batteries through a few drops of water. They were astonished to see the water send forth bubbles of oxygen and hydrogen and in doing so gradually disappear. The action which takes place when an electric current is sent through a liquid is called electrolysis. You can separate water into oxygen and hydrogen by electrolysis. To do this, we need two dry cells, two carbon rods, wire, a glass tumbler, water, washing soda, and a teaspoon. There is no danger of fire or shock in performing this experiment. Battery current is used. Do not try to use power from the 120 volt AC lighting circuit. It is dangerous for an inexperienced person to handle and is useless for this experiment. Direct current is required. Batteries produce direct current. You can use a 6 volt automobile storage battery or dry cells. You have a choice of two types of dry cells, a large number 6 dry cell used for doorbells or the size D flashlight cell. The number 6 cell is 2.5 inches in diameter and the size D cell is 1 and 5 sixteenths inches in diameter. Number 6 cells are easier to connect because the terminals are provided with thumb nuts for clamping the screws or the wires. Size D cells cost much less than number 6 cells, but to connect them it will be necessary to solder wires to their terminals. The two cells which form the battery for this experiment should be connected in a series, as shown. Notice that the wire which connects the two cells connects the positive terminal of one cell to the negative terminal of the other. 
The positive terminal of each cell is a brass cap in the center of the top, and the zinc case which encloses the cell is the negative terminal. Positive and negative are in indicated by plus and minus signs. The terminals of the battery are connected to two small carbon rods about two inches long and five sixteenths inches in diameter. You can obtain the carbon rods by cutting open two old type D flashlight cells with a can opener or hacksaw blade. Use wire made for connecting doorbells. You can buy a small coil of this at almost any dime store. Wash the carbon rods in warm water before using them. The wires which connect the carbon rods to the battery can be attached to the rods by soldering to the brass cap or by twisting the wire around the upper end close to the cap. The insulation must be scraped off the end of each wire so that it is bare wherever it comes into contact with the carbon rod. When the rods have been connected to the battery, fill a glass tumbler two-thirds full of clean water. Add three or four heaping teaspoonfuls of washing soda to the water and stir until it has dissolved. Be certain that you use washing soda and not baking soda. Immerse the two rods in the solution. Do not let the rods touch one another and do not immerse them so far that the solution touches the wires of the brass caps. Each rod should hang down in the solution about one and one-fourth inches. You can bend the wires over the edge of the glass so that the rods will remain in this position. Observe closely what happens. The surface of that portion of each rod immersed in the solution will become gray in appearance. It is covered with a layer of tiny bubbles. The bubbles grow slowly, and when they become large enough, leave the rod and rise to the surface of the solution. The bubbles which form on the rod connected to the positive terminal of the battery are smaller and grow more slowly than those on the other rod. They are bubbles of oxygen. The bubbles on the rod connected to the negative terminal of the battery are hydrogen. More hydrogen than oxygen is released, about a twice as much. An electric current will not pass through pure water. Washing soda was added to the water to form a solution, which will permit an electric current to pass through it. If current is passed through the solution long enough, almost all the water will be broken up into hydrogen and oxygen. However, the battery used in this experiment would be exhausted before that happened. How to prove that the bubbles are oxygen and hydrogen. Looking at the bubbles formed on the carbon rods does not reveal whether they are oxygen or hydrogen or ordinary air. It will be necessary to capture some and test them to prove that they are oxygen and hydrogen. The bubbles can be collected in test tubes. The best size to use for this experiment is a test tube about 6 inches long and 13 sixteenths inches in diameter. <clears throat> this is what we will have to do. <clears throat> The two dry cells should be connected in series. Carbon rods removed from old size D flashlight cells are connected to the battery by flexible wires. No metal should come in contact with the solution when the rods are submerged in it. To protect them, the brass caps on the rods and the copper wires soldered to the caps are wrapped around the rods should be painted with hot paraffin or candle wax. A solution which will conduct a current of electricity is an electric light. The electrolyte used in this experiment is prepared by dissolving 12 teaspoonfuls of washing soda in a quart of water. Enough solution will be needed to fill both test tubes and almost fill the bowl. Fill one tube at a time with the washing soda solution. Then place the ball of your thumb over the open end of the tube. Turn the tube upside down and immerse your thumb and lower end of the tube in the solution in the bowl. Do not remove your thumb until the end of the tube is below the surface of the liquid in the bowl. If this is done properly, none of the solution will escape from the tube and there will be no air in it. Without letting any liquid escape, slip a carbon rod into each tube. The test tubes should lean against the side of the bowl in a nearly vertical position. The bubbles which form on the rods will rise and collect at the upper end of each tube. The gas will gradually displace the solution in the tubes. The carbon rod which is connected to the positive terminal of the battery will produce bubbles of oxygen and the other rod will produce hydrogen. There will be twice as much hydrogen produced as oxygen. It will require a half hour or more to fill the test tube with hydrogen. <clears throat>